All right, this is Dr. Osborne. This is that one part of the challenge that people don't want to participate in, but we're going to talk about alcohol today. Um, I just want you guys to know that chronic alcohol intake, like literally at even moderate levels, and we think about what is that? That's one to two drinks a day, seven to 14 drinks a week. That's like a six pack of beer can disrupt your brain. So when people drink, what they don't realize is that your prefrontal cortex, which is the thing that stops you from uh, having impulsive behavior, um, what it does is it, it decreases that ability. And that's true in the short term while we're drinking, but the problem is, is that over time, it rewires that circuitry um, when we're not even drinking there. And what they find is that chronic drinkers, people that drink even one to two nights a week, have had their brain actually rewired to have less impulse, to, to, they're more impulsive. And what it does is it damages that prefrontal cortex and it rewires all those circuits. And but what they find if you don't drink, it's reversible within the two to six months of actually saying no. Um, so for most social or casual drinkers, that's okay, but chronic users, they, they, they'll only partially recover, um, but they'll lock, probably have long lasting effects. So what happens when people drink, it shuts down that prefrontal cortex and those circuits in there also control your memory. Uh, and then there's this, there's this fork in the road. You know, you have group one people who actually feel sedated after a few drinks. Um, and then there's also the second group, people who don't feel sedated after a few drinks. So why is this, uh, um, why is this important? Because people that don't feel sedated, they have a predisposition to alcoholism. So people who start drinking at a younger age also, um, people like 13 to 15, unfortunately are more likely to de develop dependence, uh, regardless of their family history of alcoholism. And what we also know is that people who dr delay drinking into their early 20s, the good news is, is they're less likely to develop dependence. And the reason being is that the, the, the teenage brain is a developing brain. And so if it's exposed to the alcohol, it's going to wire the circuits that that's normal to feel like that. So people who drink consistently, even in small amounts, like one per night, the other thing that happens is they, in, they experience increased cortisol release. That's your stress hormone from your adrenal glands. And that happens when they're not drinking. So when they're not drinking, they'll actually feel more stress, more anxiety when they're not drinking. Remember, cortisol is your fat depositing hormone. So when we have increased alcohol tolerance over time, what's going to happen is you're going to feel less, uh, you'll feel less of that good blip and more of the pain signaling, the, 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 the stress that you're feeling because of the cortisol that's been released. So what you end up doing is you try to drink more alcohol to try to activate the dopamine and your serotonin molecules so you'll actually feel good again. Another reason not to drink is the risk of breast cancer. It increases in women um, who drink, the, for, uh, for every 10 grams of alcohol that you consume, um, there's a 13% risk of, of having breast cancer there. Um, the reason why that happens is that alcohol actually increases uh, tumor growth and it actually suppresses the molecules that inhibit tumor growth. So it literally is a carcinogen that you're taking into your body. The other thing I want you to know is that regular consumption, it also increases estrogen levels of men. So you'll get the, 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 the breast in men and females um, will get increased est estrogen called aromatization. What that does is that creates, that's why women, when they have uh, hot flashes, they, if they drink alcohol, they'll get more hot flashes. The problem is, is that alcohol is both water and fat soluble. So when you drink alcohol, it actually passes through the cells and the tissues of your body, straight into your tissues of your body, including the blood brain barrier. So unlike most drugs and substance, substances, which actually have to attach to the surface of a cell. Now, what that means is that uh, it goes straight to your brain. And there's really three types of alcohol that you got to know. Isopropyl, the type of cleaning, methyl alcohol, or ethyl alcohol. The only one fit for human consumption, though, is the ethyl alcohol, but it's still toxic to you. And the reason being is that alcohol is actually metabolized in your liver. Um, it goes from ethanol to acetylaldehyde or uh, to acetate. So the problem with that is, is that alcohol is empty of calories and the process of breaking down alcohol is incredibly energy uh, costly to your body. And the problem is with that is it contains no, no nutrient value there. So we, that process of being drunk, you have to think of it as a poison and disruption of all the neural circuits in your brain caused by the acetylaldehyde um, as alcohol is being metabolized, metabolized. So being drunk is just that your body's trying to metabolize a poison. So people with drinking problems and, or they have chronic drinking, they tend to feel very good after drinking. And occasional drinkers will have this briefer state of feeling good, which unfortunately fades quickly. 
So now the question is, is what I want you to think about. Remember, your brain controls the function of your body. This is why this is part of a challenge, because it reduces your cortisol levels. But what happens to our brain when we drink? So what ends up happening is some of the acetaldehyde and acetate, they make it across that blood-brain barrier. And what it does is it suppresses the neurons. It just literally like, like stops the neurons in your prefrontal cortex. Remember, that's the area that's responsible for thinking and planning and suppression of impulsive behavior. And the, the problem is, is that alcohol has a very strong effect on suppressing the, those neural networks. And it also stops the formation of memories. That's why people can black out and not remember what happened and to be able to store those memories. And that's like, so that's why we, we always forget what happened when we drink and people have a better memory than we do. But high levels of alcohol consumption, you know, 12 to 24 uh, drinks a week is an absolutely, an absolute cause of a degeneration of neurons. Literally, if you're having 12 to 24 drinks a week, you're destroying your brain. When we start looking at low consumption, one to two drinks a day, seven to 14 drinks a week, it's also linked to like a thinning of the cortex of your brain. It literally thins and causes the cortex to wear away there. Uh, people that drink one to two drinks a night, they also experience changes in the, what they call the neural circuitry of their cortex, even when they're not drinking. And the reason for this is because there's an increase in the number of, of, of firing, right? When you, uh, um, what it, they always say, what, uh, neurons that fire together wire together. So because drinking is a habitual behavior, basically your brain learns to stop firing those neurons. So even when you're not drinking, the damage is occurring. Those neural circuits though, the good news is if you can focus on it and ab practice abstinence, within two to six months, most casual or social drinkers, their brain is actually gonna be able to repair. The problem with the chronic substance abusers, they're gonna have long lasting effects. So if you're a chronic abuser, you need to make sure that you stop right now. Now, there is um, no evidence that one to two drinks a month or every few months has any impact on the neural circuitries there. So if that wasn't bad enough, so we're gonna talk about uh, the effects of alcohol consumption on serotonin. Remember, serotonin is your happy hormone. When somebody takes an antidepressant, they'll, they, they take it to raise their serotonin levels. And serotonin is involved in so many circuits in your brain, but most importantly, it focuses on mood, it focuses on self-image and how we see ourselves. And so what happens is alcohol, when it's converted to that acetaldehyde, it disrupts that mood circuitry and it makes that hyperactive. Um, and and it would, it would, it, what ends up happening becomes hyperactive and then it plummets. You get this energized mood and then it's suppressed and we start to lose our alertness and our arousal there. And if the, it, so if you have increased alcohol and it makes you or um, it's someone around you feel better, um, what, you know, the, prop, the, the person, that, that person right there is a future alcoholic. So if you don't feel bad about yourself when you're drinking or like the, having um, like paranoid about what people think about you, you're gonna have a strong predisposition to becoming an alcoholic. Now. Let's talk about blackout drunk. Um, what that means is that the activity of the neurons in your hippocampus, hippocampus are shut off, so you just can't remember anything. So literally you're so toxic that basically your brain stops working. The alcohol will end up changing that relationship between your hypothalamus and your pituitary gland which, and your adrenal gland, which really maintains the balance of what you see as stressful. So it really rewires your whole stress response. And so what it'll do is that the level of stress or cortisol is gonna be increased substantially in people who regularly drink. So you drink because you're stressed, but you're stressed because you drink. Um, and so that's, we need to break that cycle. Um, now let's talk about genetics and alcohol. So I think one of the things that our genes are modified by chronic, chronic drinking and they'll follow, they'll, they'll follow along the pathway that, that actually controls those serotonin receptors, our GABA receptors for our mood, um, that, that whole hypothalamic pituitary access, which is how we de de deal with stress. And you take that in conjunction with the, uh, um, the, 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 um, um, you take that in conjunction with, um, that stress response there, what you'll start to see is, is that your body will not be able to, uh, you'll start to become more, um, what's the word, sensitive to the outside world there. So I, I, one of the things that I want you to just to remember is, is as we're going through this process, just know that, that, there, that when you're drinking, if your face gets really red, 
Uh, chances, uh, chances are that you actually have a, what's called very low alcohol dehydrogenase. Uh, and you basically what that means is you're going to get a toxic buildup of, to of, of alcohol that your body can't metabolize. That's why a lot of Asian people can't drink because they get what's called the Asian flesh. Their body just can't metabolize alcohol as well. But for alcoholism, there isn't a single gene. Uh, but if you have one or more of the relatives, one of your relatives that are chronic abusers, you're probably likely predispo you're predisposed. So if you have a genetic tendency there, like I said earlier, that people that start drinking at a younger age, somewhere in that three to 13 to 15, are more likely to develop dependence, regardless of any family history of alcoholism. Uh, if you have a genetic predis predispos predisposition, but you actually delay the drinking, like I said earlier, to 21, the likelihood of you becoming an alcohol abuser or having a disorder drops significantly. Now, my bigger concern is, is that how this affects our health. Um, and we've heard about the gut-brain access, but I want you to start thinking about the gut-liver-brain access. See, your gut runs from your throat to the end of your, your intestines there. And so the gut and the brain, they communicate through a nerve. Um, it's specifically called the vagus nerve. Um, and it, that job of that vagus nerve is to send out chemical signaling. The gut also communicates with like all kinds of chemical signaling to the liver. Um, so the liver, once again, everything has to talk, right? So the liver also communicates with the brain versus the, the chemical seg signaling and the nerve signaling. So the gut, the liver, and the brain are all, all working together to keep you in balance. But what alcohol does is it causes a uh, like a disruption in that gut microbiome, all the bacteria in your intestines that create all your neurotransmitters, and it ind indiscriminately kills bacteria and healthy gut which is eventually gonna cause a leaky gut. So we create a lot of inflammation in the body there. Uh, think about how you use alcohol to clean bacteria, what happens to your intestines. So when we metabolize alcohol, liver is, it, it becomes very pro-inflammatory. It releases all these cytokines that create inflammation and achiness in your body. And this the disruption, that is one of the biggest causes of the disruption of the neural circuits is that inflammation in your body and in your brain that actually allows, that requires you to uh, like drink more. So. One of the keys is, is replenishing our gut bacteria, taking your probiotics. Um, it's, it helps to reduce that inflammatory response, making sure that we keep very low sugar uh, because that will create more information there. I think one of the things that I always get questions on is hangovers, right? Hangovers are the day after drinking symptoms. What are those? So I think sleep after even one or more drink is, is not the same quality as without alcohol. Okay, sleep is when your body heals and repairs. And so when alcohol is present in your bloodstream, the architecture, the way that your sleep is, cycle is, it becomes disrupted. You get those uh, disrupted uh, gut microbiomes. Um, the headaches are gonna be caused by a vasoconstriction from the inflammation. So what ends up happening is alcohol causes a vasodilation and it makes you warm, but when it wears off, your body always wants to come back into balance, it constricts, you're gonna have high blood pressure there. Be incredibly careful about taking NSAIDs like ibuprofen, Tylenol after drinking because your liver is already taking a beating from the alcohol. Um, also, ingesting more alcohol, remember the, the hair of the dog, ingesting more alcohol will really alleviate the hangover, but even worse, um, the, uh, you'll actually get a worse hangover after that. Um, one th good thing is that uh, deliberate cold ex exposure is going to help you to really increase epinephrine and may help with the alcohol clearance in your brain and your bloodstream. Thus, a cold shower will help to detoxify you. But also, if you're not drinking, you take a cold shower, it'll help to detoxify you. So an important note is that alcohol doesn't lower your core body temperature. So be careful if you've been drinking because your, te your temperature regulation is going to be off. So if you're sick and you're drinking alcohol, it's going to make it worse. Don't uh, take a cold plunge while you're drinking there. You'll have major issues. Other thing is alcohol is a diuretic. One of the things on the challenge is making sure you drink enough water, but it, making sure that if you are going to drink, you take enough electrolytes because if you've had one to two drinks, um, uh, uh, for every drink that, of alcohol you take, you want to have two glasses of water before every alcoholic beverage. Um, and uh, the other thing is your drink selection matters. And it's not because of the sugar content. It's because of the, uh, the what are called the nitrates and the other ingredients. Like beer is, is, uh, is least likely to cause a hangover. Brandy is at the top of the list of causing a hangover. So lowest to highest, not suggesting that you do these, but beer, vodka, gin, um, white wine, whiskey, rum, red wine, and then brandy. Um, there is no magic cure for a hangover because you are toxic 
and that you've ingested a poison and your body just has to get rid of it. So uh, last thing that I just kind of want to talk about is our uh, alcohol tolerance. So what ends up happening is alcohol tolerance, it's re it basically reduced effects of alcohol uh, and reducing that repeated exposure um, like is one of the best things you can do for the neurotransmitters of your brain to be able to keep your body healthy. And so the challenge is when people start drinking, there's a, this increase in dopamine, which is your happy hormone, serotonin, which is your satisfaction hormone at the beginning of the exposure. But like we talked about earlier, over time you get increased tolerance. And so the negative of the effects, the, the negative effects of alcohol and the feeling good are no longer as robust as they used to be. And there you also you also get this shrinking feeling, this that feel good blip that happens at the beginning, it gets less and less. And so that's why people drink more and more. So if you haven't figured out by now, there's no really good reason to uh, drink alcohol except to make your body more stressed, make it more toxic, make it hurt more and more inflamed. Because alcohol moves within your bloodstream in just a few minutes. So if you eat something with carbohydrates, fats, or proteins prior to drinking or while drinking, it will slow the absorption of alcohol in the bloodstream. Um, so you won't feel as drunk as, as fast. But this is not true if you actually eat after drinking. And that's what most people do. They drink and then they eat. If you're going to drink, make sure that you're going to uh, eat before you drink. If you're drunk and you eat something, it's not really going to help anything uh, because you've already drank but it will blunt that but it will blunt the effects of anything additional that you drink um, thereafter okay this one goes without saying look if you're on the challenge and you're pregnant if you're pregnant at all do not drink alcohol please do not drink alcohol and you know everybody knows that the pregnant mom shouldn't do, uh, drink it uh, no amount no matter what the internet says and the reason because is alcohol is a mutagen and it has this incredible potential to damaging and developing baby there. Those early, uh, the early postnatal brain, it's incredibly changeable and plastic. And so the brain, the, the baby's brain can learn to look for alcohol and like alcohol. Uh, and the risk for what's called fetal alcohol syndrome, it's real. And the amount of alcohol needed to actually create that fetal alcohol syndrome, it's absolutely unknown. So if it's not good for a baby's developing brain and it's mutagenic, meaning that it can cause cancer there, maybe what we need to do is just in general, avoid it. Uh, I think the last thing that I wanna to talk to you about is alcohol and hormones. So one of the things that alcohol produces is what's called an aromatase. Of, the, of all your androgen to estrogen hormones, testosterone to estrogen. And so what it does is it accelerates that conversion of testosterone to estrogen. And it, so it can lead to, in men, it can lead to big breasts, it can lead to diminished sex drive, and it increases our fat storage there. So um, if you're having testosterone issues, hey, get off the alcohol. So are there any benefits to alcohol? To me, no. I don't think there's any benefits whatever. You heard about reversterol and red wine. Oh, you need to have that, you know, that's good for you. Look, for you to have any therapeutic effect of red wine and the reversterol in there, you, should, you would have to consume more alcohol, red wine than anybody would have to consume. The best amount of alcohol to drink, just in short, is no alcohol. That's why it's on the challenge. Uh, just know that alcohol increases your cancer risk. So taking folate and B12 may help slightly in the formation of tumors, but it won't stop the progression of the tumors. Literally, you're drinking something that will create tumors in your body. And just know that alcohol exposure leads to decreases in testosterone, your power hormone. Uh, and so I want you to think about you have this thing that we can avoid that has no benefit whatsoever to you and it has all negatives to you. My suggestion is, why don't you try for the next 30 days just to say no. Hey, this is Dr. Osborne. If you have any thoughts or questions, just put them down below and I'll make sure I answer them for you. Have a great day.